moderating today's session. Before handing over to our speakers, I first have to find my notes. And yes, I would like to acknowledge um, that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenape Wak, and Adewanderon's peoples, and that this land continues to be home to diverse indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. And um, the title of today's talk is Gameplay and Game Design for Library Education, a panel on quote unquote our LIS careers. Before um, we get started, I'd like to do uh, cover some very quick housekeeping. I'd like to point out that the session is being recorded and um, with the speaker's permission will be shared afterwards on social media. We currently ask all the listeners to keep themselves muted for the duration of the talk. Presentation will last for approximately 30 minutes. And then after that, we, as always, are gonna have some time for a Q&A session or any comment that you wish to direct to the presenters. Um, if you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please use the Zoom function to raise your hand. Um, this is probably located in your reactions button. If you can't find it, of course, um, as always, feel free to type your question into the chat and we will read it out for you. With that said, I would now like to introduce today's speakers. Um, Ariel Vanderschans is an LIS PhD student in the Faculty of Information Science at Western University. She has an MLIS, an MA in Linguistics, and a BA in English and Linguistics. Um, Ariel is interested in story crafting and communities of practice. Currently, she studies bookbinding through the Canadian Bookbinding and Book Arts Guilds of Canada. Then our second presenter for today is Alex Mayhew. Um, he is an LIS PhD candidate, also at FIMS, um, earned his MLIS in 2016, um, also at FIMS. And before that, he earned an undergraduate degree in philosophy at the University of Ottawa. And Alex is interested in thinking tools and philosophical engineering, particularly knowledge organization. And our third speaker for today is Sarah Conwell. She is a doctoral candidate um, also in the LIS program at FIMS, building on previous degrees in linguistics, um, her master's in anthropology and cognitive psychology, her bachelor's. Her research interests include multilingualism, natural language processing, and everyday information seeking. In essence, she focuses on the interaction of information technologies and human linguistic diversity. Okay. Um, and now I'm ready to hand over to the speaker, so go for it. All right, I'm just gonna get the screen share going. Um, that looks good, all I can see it. That? Yeah, all right. That's good. So um, welcome to our talk. Uh, the order of our presentation, I'm going to give a brief overview of the game RLIS Careers followed by Sarah, who's gonna to touch base on the education and theory in the background. And then Alex is going to introduce the design process and how we created this game. And then if there's time, we hope to have a little brainstorm activity with everybody. So our LIS Careers is a tabletop role-playing game with an encounter deck, meaning that there is no DM in traditional role-playing games. Instead, the DM is a deck of cards, which Alex will touch on. And so you can see here the objectives from the LIS Games Career Packet. And it says, players work together to create enough impact through advocacy, reach, and credibility, which is our arc points, to overcome the encounters they face in each year of their career. Encounters are overcome when their impact score is reduced to zero, and through their career, players get promotions, enabling them to overcome higher encounters. The game ends when the card deck is complete, and role play is encouraged to discuss the various issues facing librarianship. So that is our objective that we hope to um, enable with the game that we have created. So a basic gameplay overview. When you're playing the game, you start with character creation. So you can see on the side here, our character creation sheet is divided into arc points, title skills, general skills, and encounter skills. When you begin creating your character, everybody is given two arc points in every category of advocacy, reach, and credibility, and then an additional six skills 
points to use however you wish. And so we encourage people to take title skills and general skills. And the title skills are librarian, educator, researcher, public servant, and archivist. And these can be mixed and matched. So you don't have to be just a librarian. You can be a librarian and a public servant or an educator and a researcher. And there are certain combinations that work well, but of course, players can decide whatever works for them. So for example, a librarian can dedicate one extra reach point per level and a researcher can, no, a public servant can restore one reach point per level. So you'll notice if you're spending your reach, you can also restore your reach. That's a good combination. The general skills allow you to interact with the deck, with the encounters and with other players. So collaborate allows you to share your art points. Literature review allows you to look at upcoming cards. So you dedicate your six skill points into whatever areas you'd like to dedicate them in, except for the encounter skills, which is unique to the archivist. Encounter skills are skills that the various encounters in the deck have, and an archivist is able to go into those archives and adopt one of those skills for themselves. So that's the rundown of how you design a character. The biggest thing to then understand after that is our arc points. So arc points are used to defeat encounters and the way arc points work is you multiply whatever is on the table and that creates a professional impact or we just refer to it as impact. And that impact is placed against the encounter's own impact. So every encounter has an impact number in the upper right corner of their card. An impact could be 60, um, or 10 or 40. And as you see on the table here in the picture, this team has generated an impact of 15 and that would be subtracted from the encounter's impact. So advocacy is how you influence people, reach is how many people listen to you and credibility is how you're seen in the public. The encounters, so I've talked a lot about these already. The encounters is the deck of cards and there are a few other things besides encounters in the deck of card. And they're drawn at the beginning of each round and they represent various issues that may come up in a librarian or archivist or educator's career. So you can see here, we have minor scandal, copyright infringement, budget cuts, fire floods, corporate influence, and of course the pandemic. Um, and they range from level one to six. So in order to defeat the game, you do need to get through the whole deck. However, if you wanted to make a game easier, you could remove certain encounters, especially the higher levels, which require high impact. But again, the higher level also doesn't come into effect until players have reached, for example, with the pandemic, three promotions given at the end of a round if an encounter is defeated. So during the round, players can take up to three actions and each encounter has two actions. Some encounter actions happen simultaneously um, and everything is explained on the cards. And the player's actions can be to use a general skill. So someone could use innovate, which allows them to shuffle discarded cards back into the deck. You can dedicate an arc point. So as a librarian, I could dedicate an extra reach point. So I could maybe dedicate two reach arc points, or you can restore an arc point. And this is especially useful for credibility, which is kind of considered your health points. If your credibility is down to zero, you don't get to do anything that turn. If everybody's credibility is down to zero, then you've lost the game. Aside from encounters in the deck, we also have some professional developments, some setbacks and some perks. And not pictured here, there's also a quiet year card in which nothing happens that round, but you still have a chance to work against the encounter. Uh, this was developed when we found out the game was rather difficult. <laughs> so you can see in the bottom, the learn new office equipment, sick leave, stuck in a meeting, those are all professional setbacks and they range from minus one skill point or minus two skill points. In the middle, we have our perks, and these are cards that the players get to take into their hand if they come across them, and they give you certain perks. And then at the other side, you have host a conference, improve accessibility, earn a new certification. These are like the setbacks, and they either give you two or one skill point to each player, so that allows you to grow your character. 
The game comes to an end, as I said, when the whole deck has been um, completed. And again, you can change the deck size if it's taking too long or if everybody's credibility has been reduced to zero. Um, there is a link that we will share in the chat to a gameplay tutorial where you can find out more about the different aspects of the game, but also watch us play the game. And now Sarah is going to talk a little bit about the theory and education. Yes, yeah, so um, one of the things that makes games so fun to play outside of the classroom um, is also some of the elements that make them great teaching tools. Um, this is a list uh, from Greenhalg, but basically we wanted to provide a, a space for new library students or like pre-practice library students to think about what their practice would look, uh, would look like um, in real life. Next slide, please. Oop. Um, one of the ways in which we've kind of measured the effectiveness is using Nicholson's uh, recipe um, measure. Um, essentially, players need to be well supported with information while also um, being situated in a context that makes sense and has educational elements. Those are kind of like the information and exhibition, exhibition elements, but also it should be fun and um, should give them a chance to reflect on their experiences to help deepen engagement, which then deepens learning. Uh, specifically to libraries, uh, one of the gaps that was noted by Nicholson uh, in their survey was that uh, while most libraries, 77% of libraries in the United States do have games or support gaming, um, very few LAS courses actually cover gaming um, the benefits of gaming or what games are. So in addition to this game having a specific library pedagogical purpose, um, it can also be pedagogy about games itself. <laughs> um, the benefits in games, like I said before, include social interaction, information and literacy benefits, um, and general cognitive benefits. But we're focusing mostly on the strict specific curricula content. Um, in that, as Martin and Martinez put it, exposure to games and coursework helped pre in their study found was found to help pre-service librarians to understand the educational value and potential uses of games, and not just for children, but for adults too. Uh, so, for specifically for our game, we envision people using it in library schools or potentially as a training tool in libraries or other information organizations. Um, the role play, playing element is one that we think is very important because it helps people adjust on the fly to think about uh, new situations and challenges from the game, but also to encourage creativity, allow students to brainstorm what kinds of other challenges they see themselves envisioning. When you think through meeting a challenge that helps you when you, that kind of practice helps you when you meet challenges in real life. So we hope that this game will give students those kind of experience. But one of the most important things is that the game itself um, won't teach if it's not well grounded. Um, and that means that if you want to use it well, you should probably have a post game debrief session uh, to help connect the concepts in the game to course content and let students uh, reflect on their experiences and build on them further. And now I'll pass it on to Alex to get into how we designed the game and uh, some fun activity. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so um, uh, the three of us and uh, many people besides have an interest in games. They are a great deal of fun, but they can also expand, uh, expand our horizons. So we, we kind of wanted to build a game, um, but uh, how do you do that in uh, in a library environment or for a library environment? And um, a long time ago, we encountered something called the uh, ALA's Future Trends. Um, I forget which class it was in, but uh, it was this list of some 20 or 30 emerging trends that uh, are going to affect uh, librarianship in the next uh, decade or, or longer. And we uh, we looked at these and we thought, these are the encounters librarians are going to face, our information professionals are going to uh, face. Um, 
And that, that sparked the initial impetus for, for designing the game. These are, if you take a traditional Dungeons and Dragons terms, these are the monsters. These are the things that uh, are, are uh, well, the challenges. Uh, and then from there, um, various other components started uh, coalescing. So there's news and current events. Um, you might have heard of this global pandemic going on uh, that we thought that that might be an interesting um, uh, final uh, or at least most powerful um, uh, encounter uh, in the deck just to make it a little bit topical. And of course, we all have our personal experiences. Some of us have worked in uh, information institutions and are aware of some of the things that could happen and we brought some of those experiences to bear too. Uh, the next step uh, that we thought about is, okay, if this is the world that uh, the players are going to encounter, um, what is the player going to be? Like, how are they going to be represented? Are they just sort of an abstract thing? Like when you play Monopoly, there's no separate thing, or is it going to be like a real character uh, like you would when you um, play Dungeons and Dragons that has its own identity and its own path? past and history. We kind of uh, split the difference a little bit there and we decided to make a sort of a player avatar. Um, and this, uh, this sort of pseudo version of yourself, which could be yourself or could be quite a bit different. As was mentioned earlier, um, the idea of having a, um, uh, the ability to wear different identities and see how you would respond in those situations is made possible by having at least to some degree, obviously not completely, uh, by having a character sheet where you can be something that uh, you didn't end up being. For example, I have some interest in archives, but I am not an archivist. So be, taking the archive skill is a way of thinking about uh, the various challenges in the world in a way that I wouldn't uh, necessarily have uh, front of my mind. Um, so we started thinking about uh, the various different um, uh, careers that uh, might exist within the LIS, uh, broadly conceived, and these sort of like things like librarians, researchers, and educators, these sort of were um, our original concept uh, uh, to build on, and we consider these to be very similar to the Dungeons and Dragons classes. Um, and then from there, we just kept on bringing the analogy and said, okay, so what are the Dungeons and Dragons skills? And we invented a bunch of general skills that would be similar. Uh, and then we try to um, take the various stat points that you have, your strength, your dexterity, and your wisdom. Uh, anyway, uh, and we, we merge that into the, the various uh, numerical components of, of what the character would be. These ended up being our arc points. Um, now, not all of this survived the original conception. Um, the D&D classes inspired the title skills, but the title skills no longer operate like D&D classes did. They did originally, we originally had 20 levels. Now things tend to work in six levels. It, there was a lot of iterations anyway. Um, but core to the mechanic that, uh, that, we, that we conceived of is the idea that it would be fundamentally a cooperative game. And in that way, um, instead of one person's contributions being additive to another person's contributions, uh, we decided to make the fundamental mechanic of cooperation be multiplicative. So if uh, two people cooperate there, um, it, it's much more impactful uh, to, to work together. So this makes it uh, very much a team game. Um, and this also meant uh, that we, we could look at the encounters as, as like overcoming the environment, I suppose, is a way of, of thinking about it. Um, this was inspired from uh, classic video games where you know, you're, you're going through the dungeon, you hit things, the monster hits you and you, you lose your life. We have an element of that and you can lose some credibility. But um, it was really inspired in part from this idea uh, that, it, that I encountered in this horrible review of a horrible video game called Superman 64, where Superman cannot be hurt. No matter what, the monsters can't kill him. But the monsters can destroy the world. And if the world gets destroyed, the city gets destroyed, then, then Superman loses. So the idea here is that you have to protect the city, you have to protect the world. And that's just a very different way of thinking about how to um, deal with the various encounters. And 
that's what you, uh, we try to capture at least a, a flavor of that in this game where you have to um, overcome the encounters. You can't, you can't directly um, affect the, the, the world necessarily, but you can, you can uh, uh, use your reach and you can use your advocacy. And you can get the people um, be convinced that this is a problem and sort of like by, by motivating people to care about the problem, the problem is overcome. So that's what the reach and advocacy is uh, supposed to represent. Anyway, next slide. I'll try and be a little more concise. Uh, game design process, the mechanics, um, which is, I admit, where my mind often rests, uh, we, we stole from everything. So I already said Dungeons and Dragons. The deck mechanics um, came largely from Magic the Gathering and Munchkin. Um, the one of the things that Dungeons and Dragons really requires to have a really uh, good story is usually a dungeon master or a game master to direct the story. We didn't want there to be that sort of a learning curve. We wanted, uh, you know, four people to be able to sit down without ever having played it before to be able to play it. Uh, and we took uh, uh, a lesson from the game Fiasco here of a non uh, game mastered game. Um, the, the way that the system works is such that uh, you can continue to have a story even without some one person directing it. And the um, combination of the deck ideas from Magic and Munchkin really served uh, that purpose. And um, uh, Shade Geek is somewhat similar in that regards too. Next slide. All right, uh, so after designing the game, it was play tested multiple times and it was necessary. Um, the very, very first iteration of the game, I believe Ariel was trying that and it was just so difficult, it was not fun. Uh, yeah, I rage. Was, I rage. <laughs> yeah. Um, later -ish, uh, iterations became too uh, easy near the end. Um, so in order for a game to be a successful pedagogical tool, it really does have to be fun. Um, and we eventually, I think, got something. Uh, but yeah, so we played as after our initial character design, uh, we increased the starting stat points because otherwise the characters would all just lose all their credibility way too quickly and then the game would be over. Uh, we altered how the encounters work. We moved from the 20 sided die concept down to a six sided die concept, making skills and encounters all capped at six. Um, we don't actually use dice in this uh, version of the game, but as you'll see later, there is a reason why we want it to be based off of dice anyway. Uh, and we uh, modified the deck a bunch, uh, adding developments and setbacks and things like that in order to make it so that it wasn't just every single year you, during your library career, you get a new problem. Because sometimes you just have a normal year, you still have the old problems and you still need to try and tackle them. Um, but it's like, it's not a brand new problem every year. So we wanted to model that. And we introduced this idea of perks, which was very much based off the Dungeon Dragons idea of feats, which allow you to just do things that you weren't able to do before. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, one of the other things we wanted to make sure of is that uh, the game would be designed uh, open source. Uh, many other games have, um, like open game licenses, D and D in particular have that, uh, and we want we want people to be participating in the design process because the designing of the game itself is actually one of the important parts of its uh, use as a pedagogical tool. Um, in fact, that is one of the things that I hope that we get to do today. Let's see what time we have. We have a little bit of time. Uh, yeah, so let's let's give this a try. All right, so I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second, but then also share um, a different screen. If I do this properly. Um, so if Alex or Sarah can leave the link in the chat. Yep, I will do that. We'll be this one right so here. So what they're linking you to is a Google document for an academic library. Now, I think actually many of the people in here are probably more media studies, which is fine. We can gear it to LIS or media studies. Um, you'll see here a list of the title skills, the perks, general skills, and encounter skills. And what we're hoping to do going forward and what we're hoping to encourage lots of people is that 
this is open source, as Alex said, anybody can take it, tweak it, change it. And what we're hoping to do is hopefully introduce specialty packs where things are geared towards certain institutions or situations, and hopefully in the future, perhaps expansion packs, which maybe add mechanics or change things. And so we're kind of hoping to spend a little time brainstorming with everyone and we can answer questions while we do it. We can discuss the gameplay and what we're also going to drop in the chat for people who are interested if they want to take a look at it while we do this is the game packet. So you can see the rules, you can see all the cards, um, the character sheet. So I've just dropped that in the chat now. So yeah. So the idea with this exercise is this is um, most of the core parts of the traditional game, but I we want to like design a FIMS version of this game. So uh, we would, you know, rename some of the general skills uh, to things that are FIMS specific. Um, so we might uh, try and invent some encounters that are FIM specific. So what sort of uh, challenges um, that are maybe LIS related uh, would you think have happened in FIMS? Have there been uh, notable stories from the history of the institution that you might want to uh, recreate in, in card format for future students to relive? As an example, um, we have uh, just the general title skill of librarian, which we imagined as a, a rather generic um, sort of librarian. And we just can change the label of that one that mechanically doesn't change any uh, for our FIMS version of the deck to be you know, a university library. Or if we want to be a librarian, if we want to be particularly specific and we, which is not necessarily what we're doing here, but we could imagine doing a, very specific version for the FIMS graduate library. And so we would maybe change that from a university librarian to Marnie Harrington. And then we could uh, come up with, oh, I, I actually, I'm not even sure if I can come up with a good example of a, an encounter that, uh, oh, we um, got a couple of suggestions here. Uh, I wonder if we could incorporate the FIMS figurines into the game. That might be an interesting one and the PhD kitchen. Um, PhD if there was kitchen. a figurine thief, that could be an encounter. Or just thief in general is not an encounter yet. Is that a, is that a thing that has happened in Fims though? Does it matter? Yeah, well, I'd like it to be, you know, if we could, something that's- A figurine really... mover, since they move around. Oh, yeah. An encounter. <laughs> find the figurine that you that was previously in the office that you can no longer find it could just be instead of the quiet year cards yeah. they could be individual figurines yeah. and maybe if you get more than one of them you get a bonus so, or something. Uh, an example that just came to my mind is like very very low level encounter would be something like new student needs to find a desk <laughs> yes that's a challenge it is <laughs> And one of the things about these specialty decks is you don't need to change that much, right? You, you change a couple of the flavors, you change a couple of the labels, and you add in a couple of uh, encounters that uh, represent that institution. And it's basically the same game, but it feels more uh, personalized to the institution that you are going to be working at or uh, learning at or what have you. And you could do this for whatever institution that you're at, whatever library, whatever archive. Um, and that's how these sort of specialty uh, decks we envision working. Um, the, the base game should be flexible enough to work just fine out of the box, but it can be fun to say, you know what we have at this library? We have a lot of people coming in and looking at, well, anyway, you can, you can imagine. Um, learning how yeah. to use the printer is a great encounter. There you go, learning how to use the printer. Printer installation day. Yep. Or year X student. I did add PhD student, and yeah. I think it's Grant who added his pie. But oh yes, you guys are free to adjust or add any suggestions or notes to the FIM specialty pack. Yep. So uh, you can also just take questions in general. Yeah. Faculty bringing pie is plus one art points for everyone. <laughs> Yeah, but also like, yes, traditional questions as well. We don't have to just do the game design components. 
So is this now the end of your official talk and the beginning of the yes. interactive part? All right. Well, thank you so much for this. Um, virtual applause. And um, this is fascinating. I'm so glad to see like how such creative stuff is happening at FIMS that I wasn't even aware of. So um, Grant. great stuff. Yeah. Grant has his hand up. I, now, are you sure you want me to go first? Yes. Okay. Um, because I loathe games. <laughs> like, I, I like. I would have a long morning at the dentist before I played games. Okay, and this has been a blind spot for me ever since I got a job in this faculty which is I have an absolute tin ear when it comes to games of any kind above the level of gin, rummy, and sorry. Uh, those really, that's really where I peaked, okay? So. Which is actually in line with librarians. Nicholson did a study of what librarians and library educators' favorite games are card games and puzzle games. Well, so <laughs> like everyone else on earth. Anyway, sorry. So does this have pedagogical value for somebody like me? Or is it a case of different strokes for different folks? Like, like, uh, okay, this would work for somebody who was brought up in the D and D tradition, somebody who understood the environment and the and the and the uh, culture of game playing, particularly role playing games, or is it something that whether you, you know, whether you, whether you were brought up in that or not, there's something intrinsically valuable about the experience pedagogically. So that even if it was like a long visit to the dentist, I would still learn something about being a librarian and it would still have value. I think that might depend on the willingness of the student uh, participant to um, try, even if it's not a thing that they, they particularly like. So if, if the person's just not interested and it's not the thing for them and they don't really want to try to participate, nothing can really help that. And, and that's fine, right? Like some people just um, uh, aren't in the mind space at that particular time that they're exposed to it to try those things out. But go ahead. I was gonna say, one of the things too that we really pushed when designing this game is that it would be a at the level of a gateway game. And so what a gateway game is something like Monopoly or Sorry or any of the family fun games in that it's designed in a way that somebody who dislikes games or doesn't like learning games should be it's at a level where it's going to be fun if you attempt to learn it it's not at a level where it's D, &D and it shouldn't be overwhelming or intimidating or require a huge learning curve we've tried to design it so it's more of a family friendly gateway game which i think will help with those who might not enjoy it and the main goal of it is also to encourage discussion so if something like budget cups or automation comes up then it's not necessarily role play now that's the word we gave it but it's more of a let's have a discussion as how would we encounter this what would we do if we were a librarian or an educator in the field what if we're using advocacy or reach or credibility what does it actually look like in the workforce it's not just oh we're using advocacy skip away what is that advocacy supposed to be or that reach supposed to be so it's a tool for discussion. Also, it's supposed to last between half an hour and 45 minutes, so it shouldn't be that painful, <laughs> unlike d d which can last years. And I guess, to me, I think if someone doesn't want to play because it is a cooperative game, their teammates will end up playing for them, and their teammates will learn a lot about what it's like to have coworkers. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> they won't learn that much. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, as a as as a as an instructor, for instance, and particularly as an instructor who's who's currently working with I, you know, ITS and CTL to to put nine zero zero two online, 
one of the questions is what sort of online activities do you bring in to uh, alleviate the the tedium of online learning and and this is something that I, I find I have a real mental block about, you know, is, you know, they, they're, they're full of, they're full of, you know, examples of, you know, this is a fun activity that they'd really enjoy. And I'm sort of going, ah, you know, um, this, that, 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 that people, regardless of their inclinations, either way, play this game. And to what extent do I, would I make it something optional for people who, had a natural bent in that direction. Sorry, I've taken up a lot of time. We might want to go to Jenna hey. next. <laughs> Jenna. Hey there. I can tell that you guys have put a lot of work into this. So um, I'm really impressed with, uh, I guess, the, the robustness of your game. I am opposite. Grant, I think. Um, I am someone who actually teaches game studies at a university, so I see all kinds of pedagogical value in game-based education. That being said, I actually came up with the exact same question as Grant, which is, what is the pedagogical value of this? What is actually being taught through playing this game? Um, and I was thinking about its application in a classroom, and you, know, you just mentioned that um, it, it's intended to foster discussion and looking at the game, it's quite broad. And I think it's to your credit that it's broad, but I do think that um, in-class discussions tend to be a bit more specialized in LIS and in any kind of a subject. So I was actually wondering if your game should be an ARG instead of a board game and if it should be replotted as uh, for those of you who don't know, ARG is alternate reality game. It's a kind of like in-person situation-based game where you're actually pretending that you are encountering the problems and you are solving them in real life as opposed to on paper. And I think that that might actually be pedagogically a more, like you, you put so much into this board game that I don't want, I don't want to screw with it too much, but I think it would be easy to adapt it to an alternate format that, you know, encourage people to kind of jump into the simulation that you're building in these scenarios. And I think that that would, in the end, wind up, you'd wind up with a much more robust pedagogical argument. Um, you know, thinking about someone like Jane McGonigal, who does ARGs all the time and has done ARGs within libraries themselves. I think that would be an approach that you should seriously consider. Well, I will um, say that it is Creative Commons, so I... Yeah, well, I mean, I have enough on my plate, but... Um, <laughs> I... but it yeah. is, you know, something to consider. Um, the other question that I had for you that takes us a bit out of the LIS realm is where does game studies fall into this? Um, and I'll, I'll preface that with a little bit of a brief story. A couple of years ago, I was talking to a, a prof who was um, on a shirt committee who was talking about, you know, some of the proposals that he had gone through from faculty members and this one proposal that he absolutely, you know, hated because it was coming from a, a, a basically an academic tourist, someone from a different discipline who was coming in and parachuting based on the popularity of games at the time. Um, this was kind of in the late 2000s and just entering the discipline and didn't see any kind of chance that this person would stick around and actually help push the field forward. And I don't think that as PhD students, you need to worry about this at all. Um, I'm not saying that, but I do think that there is space in your, um, in your presentation of the material to think about where, um, you know, for someone who is a game scholar who might be very interested in this and be, be very interested in, in, you know, talking about these kind of other games that are coming up in other fields and, and game-based pedagogy, to think about where this um, game that you've developed fits in the larger field, as opposed to just seeing it as something that is a, a production that's coming out of LIS education. So I guess my question to you is where does game studies fit into your game and uh, into your preparation for the game? We are presenting at the Canadian Games Conference at the end of the month. Yeah, and, and what are you gonna say to them? 
uh, something vaguely similar to what we've said here, and we hope to engage with them uh, with what we have. Um, we've read some of uh, their material, but uh, we are, in some sense, parachuters, though I do think we're sticking around a little bit longer than, than that, just because we do want to keep on developing this uh, off and on for, for a while. Yeah. Um, well, I guess my challenge to you then would be to think about, you know, the existing scholarship and um, integrating some of that into your presentation. Uh, that's actually a fantastic uh, idea. Do you have a place we could start? I have lots of places. <laughs> I'm sure I can put a few readings into the comments. That'd be great. Thank you. Much appreciated. I guess to get at your first question a little bit, I mean, we've had a lot of discussions about how much of a role role play should play because I do think that that's where the main pedagogical benefit of the game is. But one of the things that we've been trying to balance it with is the ease of learning and also not having, like we know that LIS educators aren't game scholars. <laughs> um, we're not experienced game scholars. Uh, so we wanted to also make it easy for people to pick up. And I think, um, so we've been trying to balance the ease of learning with how much creativity and flexibility that role playing allows, which is really a benefit, but it also kind of requires having somebody who is able to look at the game from kind of a bird's eye view and figure out how different choices will change the balance of the game and whether to allow, disallow, encourage, wait, those things can be really intimidating for newcomers. Yeah, and the other thing too, even if it was even if it was a type of role playing situation in a classroom where you give everyone a character and you formulate discussion around that, the other thing, at least in my experience, and even just within our D and D group, half the D and D group talks, half the D and D group just likes to roll dice. <laughs> half the students like to talk, half the students don't. With this being not purely role play. It allows the people who just like to roll the dice or play the cards or to discuss the game mechanics to focus on that as kind of a shelter, but also to be welcomed into some of the discussion or into some of the role playing and to still get some of that from their fellow peers and to still learn off their fellow peers because yeah, <laughs> some people just are too shy or hate games or hate role playing, especially role playing. It is a, a word that not everybody likes. One of the uh, the theories that we were looking at and uh, design choices that we were trying to emphasize was games as a safe way of interacting with with ideas um, and and each other um, doesn't always succeed, but that is something that we try to. Uh, well, that's a lot. Thank you. Good place to start. Okay, uh, do we have any other questions or comments to our presenters? I have a, maybe a little um, little request. I wonder um, just to increase the, the number of people that see this. Um, maybe we could share through our doctoral student associations if you're looking for um, some more creative input. Uh, I think we could do that, certainly for media studies and definitely for LIS, <laughs> right? Uh, see thumbs up from Effie, that's good. Yeah, because I think that's, um, I mean, it's the beginning of summer. It's not like we've seen each other very much this year at all. And now everybody's going to go off and do their own thing. Um, so I think it might be nice to try to circulate this a bit more. I'd love to see a media studies version of this. Uh, of this yeah, game. yeah, I, I agree. I think that would be really fun. Um, so yeah, with your permission, I am, um, Effie just came on camera, so maybe Effie, do you want to comment? But I think we might just share this with. I'm just wondering if you just gave us another summer project, Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> 
well. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be really fun. Yeah. I think it would be, yeah. All right. Um, amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing this with us. This was really, really fun and, and super interesting. And I'm so glad I know about this now. <laughs> and um, yeah, I guess this wraps up mediations for the uh, 2021 academic year. Um, thanks everyone for your submissions, your presentations, um, for listening, for asking questions. And yeah, we we'll hope to see you, see you hey. around back in the fall. Thanks to all of you who have organized it and uh, curated it and presented it and moderated it. That's a lot of work. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. We appreciate the kind words and it was our pleasure. Um, yeah, so thanks to the team, um, you know, Effie, Daryl, Sarah, Kristen, Jada. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. Did I? Please add. No, you're good. <laughs> okay, good. Um, and yeah, we'll see you again in, I, I think, September. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that sends, um, thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening and um, see you soon. <laughs>